So these are chapters. Eighteen and so you can find the first the first part. Eighteen and nineteen. So you can Oh, because there are three parts. <laughs> anyway, you can give it to you can give it to Phil. No problem. Thanks to the modern technology, we can keep up, keep up. Okay, so chapter 18. In the beginning of the chapter, again, the glories of uh, Parikshit Maharaj are described. And I just want to focus on three very nice verses from the beginning of the chapter, and we can discuss them a little bit. I think very important and very practical verses. So after we have a short glorification of Parikshit Maharaj in the beginning of the 18th chapter, then in uh, chapter 7, there is interesting Uh, sorry, in text seven, text seven, we have this interesting verse. Nanu dveshti kalim samrat, saranga iva sarabuk, kushalani asho sidyanti, netarani kritani yat. Maharaja Parikshit was a realist. Like the bees who only accept the essence of a flower, he knew perfectly well that in this age of Kali, auspicious things produce good effects immediately, whereas inauspicious acts must be actually performed to render effects. So he was never envious of the personality of Kali. So that's very interesting statement. If you think about it, we will go through the purport, but basically this verse is explaining that in Kali Yuga, although very degraded age, and there are so many disadvantages, actually a great advantage is given to the people. If you think about some bad activity, but you don't do it physically, you don't get a bad reaction. But even if you only think about performing a good activity, even if you don't do it physically, you are getting the benefit for this good act. So in the previous ages, it was not like that. Even if you just think about doing something wrong already, you are getting the reaction. For it. Whereas in Kali Yoga, it's given great advantage to the people. Why is that? Why is that? Well, because in the previous ages, for the people, it's much easier to control themselves, to control their senses. The purity is bigger. So when the purity is bigger, you have to take more responsibility, meaning for a very small uh, wrong conduct, immediately you are getting a serious reaction. But in Kali Yoga, we are constantly <laughs> doing something wrong. So if, if we have to be punished for every toad that we have, every bad toad, I mean, we won't have any chance. So that's why it's given like a special, what is the English word? Concession. Concession. Thank you very much. <laughs> special concession for that. What, what, what does that mean, concession? Because my English is not as perfect as Spanish. He'll, he'll explain. What is concession? Excuse me? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah. It's like it's like let's say if you drive drive with what like 50 miles, they'll give you a fine. 
But then suddenly they decide, no, actually, only if you drive with 70 miles, then we'll give you a fine 50 is okay. It's kind of like a grace. Like yeah, a special grace, you could say. <laughs> The age of Kali is called the fallen age. Okay, that's the answer of the question. In this fallen age, because the living beings are in an awkward position, the Supreme Lord has given some special facilities to them. So by the will of the Lord, a living being does not become a victim of a sinful act until the act is actually performed. In other ages, simply by thinking of performing sinful act, one used to become a victim of the act. On the contrary, a living being in this age is awarded with the results of pious acts simply by thinking of them. So you just think, oh, I, I wish to give donation to this and this person. You don't do it actually. You never do it physically. But just because you thought about it that you want to do it, it's already considered you did it. Just see how, how easy it is to make investment in Kali. That's the benefit of this age. Maharaja Parikshit, being the most learned and experienced king by the grace of the Lord, was not unnecessarily envious of the personality of Kali because he did not intend to give him any chance to perform any sinful act. He protected his subjects from falling prey to the sinful acts of the age of Kali. And at the same time, he gave full facility to the age of Kali by allotting him some particular places. At the end of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that even though all nefarious activities of the personality of Kali are present, there is a great advantage in the age of Kali. One can attain salvation simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord. Do you know this verse? Very famous verse from Shri You know? Kalao de Kalao dosha de rajan astihe ka mahaguna. This age of Kali is considered like a huge ocean of mistakes. But still, there is one very, very great quality about this age of Kali. Kirtanateva Krishnasya Mukta Sangha Param Brajet. Just by performing Kirtan, Harinam, singing the names of Krishna, one can become free from the whole material contamination, Param Brajet, and he can go to the Supreme Abode of Krishna. Just by making Harinam, just by repeating the names of Krishna. This is, uh, I can send you a little later, I'll check in the book. It's 11. Kento, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. There's a thing that in another section earlier, same situation where the person in charge of taking some kind of strong action is forced to take the strong action and be merciful at the same time. Arjuna. Yeah. But I can't do that, right? So I wonder how do we see the vote in those in a situation where someone has done something where punishment is required or rectification is required, but also where you don't want to be harsh because you know you don't want to give them when when to punish and when to be merciful. How to make a balance. Right. So this very special mercy of the Lord, because the punishment is uh, punishment personified is a, a his son of the Lord. So this is how it is described in the in Shastra. So if you don't administer punishment properly, then punishment will punish you. Therefore, all these professions, all these. Uh, you, um, positions in society, of judge, for example, they are taken only by very highly qualified people, and the supreme judge in this material world, Yamaraj, you now he doesn't make any mistakes in judgment. Why? Because 
sim, simply he is always in contact with Paramatma. Krishna tells him, actually. So this is the answer for your question. Um, unless you are in contact with the Lord and he tells you what to do, then you better uh, be very careful about administering punishment. Because if you don't, if you don't do it properly, it will come back to you. And it will destroy uh, not only you, but any anybody connected to you. Your uh, dentist, your uh, lawyer, your uh, wife, your children, your family, your whole village will be destroyed. This is what Chastra says. So if you, so better be safe. <laughs> if, and if this is not your duty, don't, uh, don't go there. And if it is your duty, then you have to study uh, Mano, uh, Shri Prabhupada's books, and pray for the mercy of the Lord to give intelligence. We should study and rest, but like, if the situation arises or something has to be done, we're in a position that someone where you've been placed as you're in charge of this and of it. Therefore, Prabhupada says the leaders of society, they should study man. The leaders, that means the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, especially, they should study man. The Vaishyas also. So what if it's like practical situation, for example, he's in charge for five bhaktas in the temple. <coughs> well, and they don't get up for Mangalarti, for example. Then you can punish them by uh, asking them to chat extra, 10 extra rounds or something. But that's not so really punishment. Give them spiritual punishment. Yeah, it's not really punishment, what punishment properly means. Punishment means to, you know, to punish someone by uh, forcing him, coercing him to experience some uh, uh, bodily discomfort. That's what punishment means. <laughs> But this is something else. You know, you're just trying to infuse the devotees. Asking him to chant more around, that's not real punishment. It's it's blessing. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> But I have the choice to send them back. But at the same time, um, I, I can choose not to. But they say a person harm me, and I'm like, mm -hmm. it's okay. I, I go into my tent and relax and I keep doing it. I heard something once that said, um, how much I have to take. Uh, how much time I have to take until I stop taking harm? So that it's on the question. How much venom do you have to take to your die? So, what can be done in that situation? You know, you have the power to let you. You have to protect yourself. Yeah, you're not obliged to, physically, if you must say, you're not obliged to tolerate somebody coming in. Uh, uh, harming your body because your body is given to you by the Lord to engage this body in service of the Lord. So it is your it is your duty to protect your body as a vehicle, as a medium of service to the Lord. You understand? But if you if you have this body, that means you can do service for Krishna. If somebody comes in this and harms the body, this will be bad for your service to Krishna. You understand? So it's your right to protect the body. You should not allow anyone to just to come to harass you. Well, basically, you're doing a disservice. Our body is like an asset. Yeah, it's your share given to the world from the world. To, to the world. There is such such a story with Narada Muni. He gave initiation to a snake and made her a devotee. And he said to the snake, "Now you have to be non-violent." And uh, the snake was trying to survive but you know when the snake is not protecting uh herself and the, all the animals they were taking advantage and stepping on her and kicking her and then the Muni came one year later and said everything is okay and she said no actually since i'm not biting uh everyone is on my case and and, and she said, and I don't know what to do. And then the, the, the Narada Muni, he said, well, you know, I told you not to bite, but I I didn't tell you not to 
open your hoods and to uh, like create fears in others. So, <laughs> so we will we will uh, defend ourselves, but we as much as possible we will try to avoid violence. But you have to defend yourself. It may look a little bit like a contradiction, but actually there is no contradiction because you're not trying to uh, to hurt others. You don't want to hurt others. But if they start hurting you, you just protect yourself. Then you do the need for. But on your own, you don't have a desire to go to others and to punish them or to whatever, kill them or create uh, disturbance and pain in their life. So your mentality is completely different. Your mentality is non-violent. But if they come and they attack you, you just protect yourself. That's different. I have another question. If we, if we don't have many negative thoughts of having all this or doing something bad, what bad thing? Oh, what circumstances happen to us? Because in many, many previous lives, we had thoughts and desires to create bad to others. So now the results from all these actions is coming to us. It's like yesterday, yesterday you went, you, you punched someone in Bronx. And today you are in Brooklyn and someone comes and punches you. And you say, but I didn't do anything bad to anyone today. I was just walking peacefully in the park and I was enjoying the sun. Yeah, but yesterday you did, and now the reaction is coming today. So this is how it goes. But sometimes, I mean, very often we don't see the connection between these two. We think, oh, I didn't do anything wrong today to anybody. Yes, but yesterday you did. <laughs> and now the reaction is coming. It's just a little bit difficult. Difficult to, to understand. Because you see, it's like you are staying in a room. Yeah. You you you're staying in a room, and there is a window, and you just see a bird is coming through the window. Yes, yes, that much four meters. You see the bird flying, but you don't know from where the bird is coming, and you also don't know where the bird is going. You see only this. So this is what's happening. We are seeing that much of our existence and we are seeing but why this thing is happening to me it doesn't make sense, it doesn't have logic. But we don't see everything that happened before that, countless of lifetimes. And we also don't see what will happen in the future. So on the basis of this, whatever, like four meters of distance that we see in our life, we make the conclusion. Oh, something bad is happening, but I don't deserve it. Or something good is happening, but I don't deserve it. No, just we don't see the, the, the bigger picture. That's the idea. This is actually one of the most simple points to grasp on spiritual life, but the most difficult points to grasp. That everything that happens in our life is completely 100% just. Nothing is unjust. It's such a simple point but so, so, so difficult to, to to accept that whatever is happening in my life, actually, it's, uh, it's just, I'm not getting something that I don't deserve. It's very difficult to, if someone is able to swallow this, that means he's very advanced, very, very advanced spiritual. Generally, like when we don't have problems in our spiritual life, we'll be like very nice mood, very happy, very spiritual, this, that. The moment something bad happened to us, immediately we will like start revolting and speaking against everybody else and against God and against destiny and this and that. Immediately we will start like, ah, oh, this is not fair. Why it's happening to me? I never did something bad to anyone. What's happening now? Very difficult. Very difficult. When something little bit difficult, bad happened in your life, very difficult to stay calm and relax and to accept it as a grace of the Lord. Very difficult. One should be very advanced spiritually to be able to do that. When you said very advanced, what do you mean by that? Advanced is a person that he's so much 
his consciousness is so much fixed on the spiritual platform that he is not disturbed from what's happening here in this world. Like we are not this body, we are spirit soul, yes? We are spirit, spiritual living entity. So now to this body, so many things are happening in this world. But because we think we are the body, immediately we think, oh, all these things, they're happening to me. I'm suffering. Like, for example, now, if you see some, uh, whatever, garbage bin outside, and someone goes there and just like, start kicking it and punching it and doing any strange things, are you going to become influenced? Like whatever, depressed by it or uh, very happy by seeing this. No, you don't care, isn't it? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have connection. You don't care about this thing. So now we, from the spiritual perspective, we don't have anything to do with the body. And these are like two completely different substances, like oil and water. It doesn't matter what you do with oil and water, they'll never mix. Never. They'll never mix. But somehow, because of element called false ego, we accept that we are the matter, we are the body. And because of that, we are actually experiencing so many problems and troubles and sufferings. This emotional identify with the body. Correct. And that's why whatever happens with the body, we accept it personally. Like, for example, now, you are friends with Phil. So you have connection. So if now someone tries to do something to Phil, you take it personally. Yes? Immediately you jump. You say, hey, what's your problem? This is my friend. You have problem with him? Okay, that means you have problem with me. Okay, let's do it. Isn't it? It's a personal thing. But now, if that was maybe whatever, like six months ago or one year ago, and if something happened, and even if you see it, it's very much possible that you just say, oh, I don't want to get into this situation. Why? Because it's not personal. You don't have connection. So the same thing is with the body. If we just go outside and look around, just walk around a little bit and look around, we will see so many people having so many problems with their bodies. Physical problems, mental problems, social problems, economical problems, so many problems. But we don't take it personally. We see it and we say, well, whatever. What can I do? I mean, I'm not God. I'm not almighty. And we just go on. But now when something happened to our body, we take it immediately very personally. Very personally. If we lose $100, it's a big problem. If we become a little bit sick, it's a big problem. Everything is very important. Why? Because it's my body. So it's a question of identification. Does it make sense? Yes, there's a lot of sense. So how, how do we, how could, what if it can help us to not identify? Not to identify. Yeah, not to identify. Like, okay, it's strong enough. We have to chant Hare Krishna. Let's read Bhagavad Gita and all these questions. Where do you go? Yes. Yeah, we have a discussion after we all sit out there and get milk. Okay. Yeah. But basically, you got it. We have to get out of it. And how to get out of it? The easiest process given for this age is to chant Hare Krishna. Because Hare Krishna is very powerful prayer and it's not different from Krishna. And if we chant this prayer, this mantra, and we are constantly in connection with Krishna, and he is the purest personality, we will be always pure also. So we won't identify with the, the body, we won't identify with, with matter. We will be always conscious we are spiritually in the end. Make sense? Allah. Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, so that was one... Uh, verse and purport I wanted to share with you and I think it's a great thing I mean at least it's giving me lots of courage 
Like whenever you think about something wrong, you don't get any reaction for it just because you are in Kali Yuga. But even if you think about doing something good immediately, it's considered, okay, you're getting the reaction. It's like whew, amazing thing, huh? Kali Yuga. Great mercy we are getting. Although such a degraded age, very easily you can make spiritual advancement. Then the next verse I wanted to share with you is text 13 from the same chapter. So also very, very famous verse. Tula yama lave na pi na svargam na punar bhavam bhagavat sangi sangasya martyanam kim utashi shaha. The value of moments association with the devotee of the Lord cannot even be compared to the attainment on the heavenly planets or liberation from matter. And what to speak of worldly benefits, benedictions in the form of material prosperity, which are for those who are meant for death. So here these verses describing amazing benefit that you are getting just from one moment association with saintly personality it's such a valuable thing it cannot be compared with anything it cannot be compared with living in the paradise it cannot be compared with the greatest benefits we get on this world like imagine the top life you can get on this world whatever like you are the king of uh Abu Dhabi, and you have a castle which is like whatever, like I don't know, five acres, and you have like 500 people who are waiting just for your words, and you have like billions, billions, billions. This lifetime, uh, this, this lifestyle cannot be compared even with one fraction of a second association with Sadhu, with very elevated spiritual personality. So this verse is describing the value of having this association. This is the most important thing about advancement in spiritual life. Like sometimes we say chanting Hare Krishna is the most important thing. Yes, I just said it three minutes ago. <laughs> but actually, the great uh, authorities there are explaining that actually association with the advanced devotees is even more important. Why? Because naturally, if you're associated with very serious devotees, you start chanting Hare Krishna, you start reading Bhagavatam, you will visit holy places, you will go and see the deities, the forms of the Lord in the temple. So you get benefit from all these things. But if you don't have association of great devotees, very advanced devotees, even if you do some of those things, it may happen that very, very, very fast you start losing enthusiasm for them. And very fast you may stop doing them. Although you may under understand intellectually. Intellectually you may, may understand. This is very important to chant Hare Krishna. It's very, very important to read Bhagavatam every day. But then your mind, he will make a strike. You say, I don't like it. I don't want to do it. I want to do something else. And your intelligence will say, no, 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 it's very important. We have to do it. We have to do it. And then intelligence will push one day, two days, three days, five days. And then at the end, the mind will say, no, that's enough. I don't want to do it. There are more important things, things that bring you more pleasure. So in this way, we may stop doing all these things. But then when we have the association of very, very advanced devotees, then very easy. The taste, the juice from the spiritual life comes very easy. Suddenly we become very enthusiastic for spiritual advancement. So this is what this verse is describing. It's a very, very famous verse. For the serious students, I recommend that you learn this verse by heart and you repeat it every day. Just to remember how beneficial is the association of devotees. It's 1.18.13. 1.18.13. And then the last verse I want to share with you from this first section is so the, 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 the sages uh, they glorify 
the life and examples of Parikshit Maharaj. And then uh, they ask Sutta Goswami, the main speaker, to continue describing the amazing pastimes of Krishna. Because until now, it was a little bit like a, like a, what is the word? Uh, like a promo story of Srimad Bhagavatam. Sutta Goswami, he just related a few stories. He gave them a little bit juice so that they become actually eager. But the real, real content of Srimad Bhagavatam did not start it yet. So now they are saying, okay, now we are really intrigued. We are eager. We want to hear. Okay, give us these stories. Give us all these stories which are describing Krishna and his pastimes and his avatars and the amazing life of his devotees. We want to hear all these things. Okay, we are ready. And now Sutta Goswami is saying, okay, we are starting. Now we are starting Srimad Bhagavatam. But just to tell you, actually the pastimes of Krishna, they are unlimited. And also uh the 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 uh how you say the depth the the depth of these pastimes is all also unlimited so i will describe them all only as much as i can according to my realization so that's also a very very important statement of sutta goswami and we will see shio Prabhupati saying something very interesting this is verse 23 from the same chapter So Sutta Goswami is saying, oh, rishis. What is the meaning of rishis? Julie knows. Sages, yes. Great, learned personalities. Oh, rishis, who are as powerfully pure as the sun. I shall try to describe to you the transcendental pastimes of Vishnu as far as my knowledge is concerned. As the birds fly in the sky as far as their capacity allows, so do the learned devotees describe the Lord as far as their realization allows. Purport. The Supreme Absolute Truth is unlimited. No living being can know about unlimited by his limited capacity. The Lord is impersonal, personal and localized. By his impersonal feature, he is all-pervading Brahman. By his localized feature, he is present in everyone's heart as the Supreme Soul. And by his ultimate personal feature, he is the object of transcendental loving service by his fortunate associates, the pure devotees. The pastimes of the Lord in different features can only be estimated partly by the great learned devotees. So Shiva Sutta Goswami he has rightly taken the position in describing the pastimes of the Lord as far as he, as he has realized. Factually, only the Lord himself can describe himself and his learned devotee also can describe him as far as the Lord gives him the power of description. So it's very interesting how different birds, they can fly to a different height. And in the same way, the different spiritual people, they, they are on a different level of their spiritual advancement. So they'll be able to describe the knowledge about God, the spiritual science, according to their level. Like there are so many different spiritual personalities, so many different spiritual traditions. And if you go and speak with them, they will give you some spiritual truth. But how much they will give you, it depends on how much spiritual knowledge they have and also how much they have realized this knowledge. So Sutta Goswami is saying, now I will describe this knowledge, Srimad Bhagavatam, but I will describe it according to my capacity. I cannot give you more than this. Still, the sages are very, very happy because they see, oh, he is the most learned amongst us. So actually, he has very deep spiritual realizations. And he, heard, he has heard from personalities who have very deep spiritual realizations, like Shukadeva Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj. So we will get lots of benefit. Yes, that's the idea. 
So he's taking a very humble position. It's like someone is asking a question and you don't know the answer. You have to say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I can ask someone, maybe he knows, then, then I can repeat. So it shows that uh, on the spiritual path, we have to be sincere and honest and we don't... We should not take a position on which we are not because there will be consequences for us, for others, for everybody. Pandava Prabhu, he was just telling me a few days ago, he started reading a book which describes the life of Madhvacharya. You know who is Madhvacharya? Yes? No? Madhvacharya is one of the great Acharyas in our disciplic succession. So, the spiritual knowledge is transmitted from guru to disciple, from guru to disciple, like that. So one of the first great acharyas in our succession is known as Madhvacharya. He's a very, very special person and very spiritually elevated, very elevated. So I mean, time frame is he was living maybe 13th century, okay. So less than 1,000 years ago. And uh, he was very, very special. I mean, this book is really special. Maybe one day we can just tell you different stories from his life. Yeah, he's special. He's uh, what type of vibe? His vibe, actually. Uh, after Brahma, this is uh, is the greatest demigod. Okay. Uh, he was special. So he's the same as Bhima from Mahabharata. Yeah. Bhima, Hanuman. So very. Very powerful personality. So anyway, at some point, there was a spiritual discussion on Bhagavatam in the school of his guru. So they were reading Srimad Bhagavatam and they read a verse and then the, some of the disciples saw that there is a difference between their Bhagavatam and the Bhagavatam of the guru. And uh, the... They are discussing why there is difference between your edition and ours, and which one is correct. Yeah. What a question I ask myself all the time. I am very surprised that what I read is God, yes. not just bad things. That's a very good question. We we have to talk about it. Very important. But just to to finish the story. So he did not answer, and he kind of, the guru said, okay, I'll, I'll answer later. It's something like what I did just now. And and Madhva Acharya, who was at that time 10, 11 years old, maybe yeah. 12. He just took some life. He was very young, and he just looked at his guru and said, if you know, just answer. And his guru said, okay, then you answer. If you know. And then Madhvacharya, he kind of closed his eyes and he thought for a while. And he said, this is the right version. And his guru said, so how, I mean, how do you know that this is, why not, not the other one? Why exactly this one? What you, you want to say, you, you know Bhagavatam or what? And, uh, and he said, Yes, this is the this is the voice of Vyasadev. Vyasadev is the author of Bhagavatam, which is actually the guru of Madhvacharya. Madhvacharya personally went to the Himalayas and he met personally Vyasadev and he studied Bhagavatam from, from Vyasadev. He knows what is Bhagavatam. And his guru was like very like doubtful. I, I'm not sure. So, so you want to say you know Bhagavatam as Vyasadeva wrote it. Yes, this is what you want. Okay, if you know, just show us. Recite what? Recite the fifth canto of Bhagavatam, huh? if you know. And then Madhvacharya, he started reciting Bhagavatam, fifth canto. This is the most difficult canto because these verses are very short and the verses from fifth canto, they are so long and it's very difficult to read them actually. It's prose. It's not. Uh, it's not poetry. Yes. Po poetry is easier to uh, memorize because yes. there is rhyme and 
Но тези за фрол, за безмолство, за безмолство, за безмолство, за безмолство, за And he just started like quoting verse after verse, verse after verse, and nobody was uh, moving. And he went on like that for three, four hours. And he recited the whole fifth canto, like these are 30 chapters, each chapter, maybe 40 verses, something like that. Uh, and his guru was like, what? <laughs> so then he understood, okay, this. This boy is special. I mean, many cases, many stories like that. But just just to to illustrate this point that it's uh, important one to know what's his situation. And all of us, we are representatives of Krishna, meaning that we can give Krishna to someone. We can give the holy name. We can give the the knowledge of Krishna to someone. But when people start asking questions, we should answer as much as we can. And if we see we cannot, either we have to go and try to look for the answer and come back, or we just have to bring people to someone else who knows more than us. We should not try to speculate and to, oh, because I'm afraid to show, I don't know, now I have to figure it out somehow or other, like that. And now how do we know that this knowledge is real? That's a very important question. Well, we have the pure uh, source of knowledge, and this is Krishna himself. Yes? The knowledge originally comes from God, from Krishna. That's why the knowledge is pure. Now, how to be sure that this same pure knowledge came to us unchanged, uncontaminated? Yes? Well, the, the Vedic technology is called Guru Parampara, disciplic succession. That means... Krishna, as the perfect personality, gives this knowledge to another perfect personality. And this perfect personality, because he's a perfect, he does not change the knowledge. And he gives it as it is very carefully to the next person. And because he is also very pure and very uncontaminated, he also presents the knowledge to the next person again. So in this way, through this chain, of perfect personalities, the perfect knowledge which starts from Krishna comes to us unchanged. Sometimes example is given, if you want to break a ripe mango from the top of a tree, what is the best way to do it? There are a chain, chain of people. One goes on the top, one goes under him, so like that. And they just, the person on the top takes the mango, doesn't throw it, he just takes it and gives it to the hand to the next person. He gives it to the next. And in this way, the mango, although super ripe, goes to the ground in a perfect shape. So spiritual knowledge is transmitted in the same, in the same way. And also by Sanskrit, we have the Sanskrit verses. So this is some proof that is the same text, the same knowledge. And still, sometimes when we read Shiva Bhagavatam, we may find Shri Prabhupada may say in this and this edition of Srimad Bhagavatam, two additional verses appear. But at the end, it's not the end of the world because it doesn't change the philosophy. The philosophy stays the same. Krishna is the Supreme, and we are his servants, and we are not material, we are spiritual, and we have to serve Krishna with love and devotion. And if we do that, we'll go back to the spiritual world. So this does not change. But some small details may change sometimes. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Shall we read a little bit? Okay. So now the real story starts with the word ekada in text 24. What is the meaning of ekada? Once. Once upon a time, as they say in the stories. Once upon a time, once upon a time, Maharaja Parikshit, while engaged in hunting in the forest with bow and arrows, became extremely fatigued, hungry and thirsty while following the stacks. While searching for a reservoir of water, he entered the hermitage of a well-known Shamika Rishi and saw the sage sitting silently with his closed eyes. 
The Muni sense organs, breath, mind, and intelligence were all restrained from material activities, and he was situated in a trance apart from the three uh, wakefulness, dream, and unconscious. Having achieved a transcendental position qualitatively equal with the Supreme Absolute. So Parikshit Maharaj was hunting and suddenly he felt super thirsty and fatigued and he was looking for a water he couldn't find good water and he entered the spiritual abode of this great sage but the sage was just meditating he was in a very deep trance so he could not see that actually the king was there the sage in meditation was covered by a skin of stack and long compressed hair was scattered all over him the king who's Pallet was dry from thirst, asked him for water. The king, not received by any formal welcome by means of being offered a seat, a place, a water, a sweet address, considered himself neglected, and so thinking, he became angry. So generally, the very etiquette is that if you go to someone's place, he has to receive you with sweet words. And he should invite you to sit down. And he should give you at least some water to drink. If possible, even some food to eat. This is the Vedic etiquette. But in this case, although he was the king, the emperor of the world, and he went to the home of this great sage, he did not got anything. So now, because he was affected by fatigue and thirst, he became agitated. And then what happened? <laughs> All Brahmanas, the king's anger and envy directed toward the Brahmana sage were of unprecedented. Being that circumstances, he had made him hungry and thirsty. While leaving the king, being so insulted, picked up a lifeless snake with his bow and angrily placed it on the shoulder of the sage. Then he returned to his palace. So he didn't do anything serious, but just he was a little bit angry and tired and thirsty. He just picked up with the end of his bow this dead snake and just put it on the shoulder of the sage as some kind of retail, ret ret tele what is it? Yes, thank you. But actually, in fact, he didn't do something serious. I mean, it's not that, okay, whatever, he punched the sage or why you are not doing this? Why you are not treating me? No, he didn't. Just he was a little bit affected, so he just put the snake on his shoulder. It was like nothing really serious, isn't it? Childish. Yes, more like a childish thing. So nothing serious. Mm -hmm. But now, what happened? Upon returning, he began to contemplate and argue within himself whether the sage had actually been in meditation with senses concentrated and eyes closed, or whether he had just been feigning uh, trance just to avoid receiving a lower kshatriya. So now, in the beginning, because he was affected, he thought, oh, he's just pretending. He just doesn't want to bother with me. He just wants to do his thing. But then later, when he became a little bit more in his senses, he actually started thinking, wait a minute, maybe he was really very deeply in trance and he actually did not notice that I was there. So that was not right what I did. So being very soft-hearted as a great devotee of the Lord, he felt guilt in his heart that that was actually, I, why I did this? It was not necessary. The sage had a son who was very powerful, being Brahmana's son. So his son was very, very young. He was only five, six years old. But because he, he grew up in this family and he was following this lifestyle, he actually had a special Brahminical power. So he was a very powerful boy. While he was playing with inexperienced boys, he heard 
of his father's distress, which was occasioned by the king. Then and there the boy spoke as follows. The Brahmana son Shringi said, Oh, just look at the scenes of the rulers who like crows and watchdogs at the door perpetrate sins against their masters, contrary to the principles governing servants. So in the Vedic system, traditionally, you have the intellectuals or the teachers of the society, Brahmanas, and they'll be, they'll be very poor, they'll be very austere, but they're considered the head of the whole society. And the Kshatriyas, although they have the practical power, they're ruling the whole kingdom, like through their hands are passing so much uh, wealth and, and, and riches and opulences, they are considered subordinate to the Brahmanas, meaning voluntarily they are taking lower position. Why? Because the Brahmanas, they are not affected from the situations. They are always aloof and they can see the situation as they are. Kshatriyas very often because of being in passionate situations, they may not be able to see the situation as it is exactly, like in this case. The first moment he couldn't judge very clearly what is the situation. And that's why uh, the, the, the boy said, just see, actually, we, the Brahmanas, we are their masters. But now they are acting in a very strange way. In a very strange way. The descendants, the descendants of the kingly orders are definitely designated as watchdogs and they must keep themselves at the door. Never heard any of the other Brahmanas or sages speak like that before. Is he only talking like that because of his immaturity? I think even with King Dana, they tried to pacify him with kind words. And then they, when they had to, they destroyed him. But I don't remember them talking down to him, calling him a dog. So it's just only the son speaking like that. Yes, that's his immaturity. Otherwise, if you see how the chapter is, Proper chapters talk to the proper sages. It's just the other way around. They always glorify one. They also basically they are very polite. Uh, the whole national system is based on the mutual protection between the brahmins and the chapters. Chapters protect the brahmins. Brahmins protect the chapters. So. Yeah, like generally the Brahmanas, what they will say is, uh, I, they have, they have a greater knowledge, but they will naturally submit themselves to the king. They will say, actually, you are giving us protection and only because of you, we can perform our duty. So actually, you are our master. They will naturally take subordinate position. And then Kshatriya, from his side, he will say, no, actually, you are our masters. We are subordinate to do, and we have to do everything only with your permission. So it, it will be like a mutual double respect. And that's why the system is working. Because naturally, the Brahmanas are respecting the Kshatriyas, and the Kshatriyas are respecting the Brahmanas. And that's why it works very, very nicely. But now in this case, we see there was a little bit strange activity from both sides. But as we will see a little later, the activity of the king was uh, what the king did. The, the, the result was too strong. The, 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 the answer of the boy was too strong. The punishment met by the boy. Yes. Didn't, it's not equal to the... Misdeed. And even this misdeed was planned by Krishna. Krishna wanted this to happen. It was not Maharaj Parishit's fault, actually. Yes. So let's see. On what grounds can dogs enter the house and claim to dine with the master on the same plane? 
So in other words, the boy is taking himself very, very seriously. But this is the emperor. It is said in the Dharma Shastras that actually the Brahmanas are above the, 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 the kings, the Kshatriyas, but the emperor is even higher. Why? Because the emperor, he is protecting thousands of Brahmanas so that they can perform their duty. But he is just, he is not very experienced. And that's why he's talking in this way. After the departure of Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead and supreme ruler of everyone, these upstarts have flourished, our protector being gone. Therefore, I myself shall take up this matter and punish them. Just witness my power. And really like a small boy, but powerful boy. So what he did, he cursed the king. The son of the Rishi, his eyes red hot with anger, so he couldn't control himself. It is said that the most important quality of a Brahmana, how you can recognize a real Brahmana, he'll be always forgiving, ready to forgive. If a Brahmana cannot forgive, he is not a Brahmana. If a Kshatriya is, is afraid, he is not a Kshatriya. If a businessman cannot make money, he is not a businessman. And if a worker is not ready to go and work, he is not a worker. So he as a Brahmana, the way how he actually acted was completely against the main principle of the Brahminical culture, the Brahminical Dharma. So this proves that his act was wrong. He became very angry, touched the water of the river Kaushika while speaking, to his playmates and discharge the following thunderbolt of words. The Brahmana song cursed the king thus. On the seventh day from today, a snake bird will bite the most wretched one of that dynasty, Maharaja Parikshit, because of his having broken the laws of etiquette by insulting my father. So he came and he was a little angry and he put this dead snake on my father's shoulder. And now because of this great offense he did, now I'm going to curse him to die. Does it match the two? When he's killing the emperor, which means the kingdom is probably going to fall on you. It's like that little thing he went outside. Of course. For everybody. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Shri Prabhupada is saying in the purport, thus the beginning of the misuse of Brahminical power began, and gradually the Brahmanas in the age of Kali became devoid of both Brahminical powers and culture. So this is actually how it starts the downfall of the whole human society. As they have a saying, I don't know, in Bulgarian they have a saying, that the fish starts smelling from the head. Have you heard this one? So, culturally speaking, the whole degradation of the society starts from the Brahmanas. If Brahmanas, they are ideal, if Brahmanas are a perfect example, if they are very austere, if they are uh, very knowledgeable, uh, naturally, all the other classes in the society, they will have respect to them and they will listen to them. And this is the way how the thing should work. Now, when the Brahmana degraded, what happened? At some point, the Kshatriyas are saying, oh, why we have to listen to them? We won't listen to them anymore. We'll just take over. So this is the, the so-called bourgeois revolution in the middle uh, ages just the aristocracy took over before that the church was the most powerful thing like the, the, the spiritual people their voice was the most important and the king subordinately uh, like voluntarily they were ready to follow the, the, the fathers of the church the, the spiritual people now at some point the kings they said that is too much they have too much power. We have to eliminate them. And they just eliminated them. And actually, they started ruling on their own. But now, when the kings for a long time, they were ruling without the help of the spiritual people. 
what the rest of the people started thinking, wait a minute, how is that? How is that? Like they are ruling and uh, they have the whole power. Uh, they have all the money. They have all the influence. But actually we are working and we are making the money. But they are saying what to happen. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And then they make a revolution, like French Revolution. So the businessmen, they just killed everybody, the, the, the kings, the, the queens, everybody. They just got rid of them. And then the businessmen, they started becoming the top of the society. Now, partially, you could say, especially in the Western world, the businessmen, they are on the top of the society. They are, they are deciding what, what will happen, what will not happen. Now, what is the problem with this? That they decide what is good and what is bad on the basis of what will make more money. There are no moral principles. There, there is no ethics. It's just about money. Like, okay, can we make money by uh, selling some uh, medicine to the people or weapon? Yes. Okay, so how shall we do that? How can we sell some weapons? Well, let's just make a war. Okay, let's make a war. Where are we going to make the war? <laughs> Uh, how can we sell some uh, medicines? Well, well, let's just make some epidemic. <laughs> okay, we can sell so many. Let's do it. So there is nobody to control them. There, there, there are no aristocracy. There are no strong kings. And there are no brahmanas. So everything goes down. Like traditionally, the schools, they are not business institutions. They are brahminical institutions. They are not for making money. They are for education. The law system is to give protection to the people. It's not just to make money. The health system is not to make money. It's to give protection to the people. But because there are no strong rulers, actually the businessmen, they took over everything. Now the, the, the education is just making money. The health institutions are just to make money. The law is just to make money. There is no morale. There, there, there are no real rules. There is no real truth. It's just about what is making money. And then in some places of the world, actually in the big part of the world, at some point the workers, they, they got fed up from this and they just said, okay, we are just, we are getting rid out of those guys. And they just kill all the, Business, businessman, whoever was there, and they just took over. And they said, okay, now we are all equal. But what does it mean equal? I mean, we would never be equal because, like, for example, you can translate better than me. Or I can, uh, whatever, maybe cook a little bit better than you. Maybe not, but let's say, maybe. <laughs> so what does it mean equal? Yes, we are equal from the perspective of opportunities. You can cook and I can cook. You can translate. I can also translate. But you cannot say we are equal. Because always someone will be better in something than someone else. So that means naturally there will be hierarchy in the human society. But uh, at that time, the workers for at least some part of time, they decided, no, now we are going to be equal. And because it was unnatural, they were just suppressing people for whatever, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, or some time. And then at some point, people, they couldn't like uh, tolerate anymore, and they just said, no, forget it. It's, it's not going to work. And again, the thing started going towards the capitalism, towards the business system. <laughs> but just the point is that perfect society means you should have all of those. And now if you start cooking cutting this or that because you don't like it, that means there'll be some problem in the side because you need all of them. It's like you may say, oh, I have a headache. That's why I'm going to cut off my head, my head or, or uh, like, I actually, why do I need uh, legs? Do you know how, how much of my energy is going into my legs? I don't need them. I'll just cut them off. You cannot do that. Your body to function, you need everything. You need head. You need stomach, you need hands, you need legs. If you cut something, that means your life is becoming un unregulated, unharmonious. So that that's the, the, the beginning, the fault was the 
brahminical uncontrol of their senses. This is how everything started going down. Of course, we can say it ultimately the plan of Krishna because it was Kali Yuga and Kali Yuga, the thing should go down. But still, it started from the Brahmins. So, the Brahmana boy considered Maharaja Parikshit to be Kula Angara or the wretched of the dynasty. But factually, the Brahmana boy himself was so because only from him did the Brahmana caste become powerless. So he was thinking the problem is in the king, but actually he himself was the problem, the real problem. Like a snake whose poisoned teeth are broken. The snake is fearful as long as his poisoned teeth are, are there. Otherwise, he is fearful only to children. The personality of Kali conquered the Brahmana boy first and gradually the other castes. Thus the whole scientific system of the orders of society in this age has assumed the form of a vitiated caste system, which is now being uprooted by another class of men similarly influenced by the age of Kali. One should see to the root cause of vitiation and not try to condemn the system as it is without knowledge of its scientific value. So Sri Prabhupada is saying the Vedic system is actually very useful and it's very nice, but everyone should play his role in a pure way. Then it will work very nicely. Now, if we just start, start accusing each other, you are doing wrong, you are doing wrong, it's not going to work. That's why it is said that the essence of the Varnashama system is respect. If the different classes in the society they don't have mutual respect, it will never work. It's not a, a system which works on the basis of orders or rules and regulations. It, it it's a culture which works on a proper education, how the different classes of society should have a mutual respect to each other. Otherwise, it will never work. You cannot just write an order, okay. Now from tomorrow we start doing it. It will never work. Same thing in the temple. Like you have so many different devotees, they have a nice life only if they have mutual respect. The moment you don't have a mutual respect to the other devotees, it will never work. Uh, you can read so many books and so many people may give you orders, you should be very respectful of this. That. No, if you don't want to take it, if you don't want to do it, it will never work. It will never work. So everything should be based on love and trust, Sri Prabhupada said. If we don't have love and trust, the whole society will collapse. This is the most important. Thereafter, when the boy returned to the hermitage, he saw a snake on his father's shoulder, and out of his grief, he cried very loudly. O Brahmanas, the Rishi, who was born in the family of Angira Muni, Hearing his son crying, gradually opened his eyes and saw the dead snake around his neck. You? What? He didn't break his meditation? So it's funny. Maharaj Pariksit, even though he was angry, he wasn't. So he didn't break the sacred meditation. He just made his gesture, but he didn't actually disturb him. But his son broke his neck. He disturbed him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting to see how one was Parikshit Maharaj, apparently he did something wrong, but actually he was acting under the influence of the spiritual energy of God. Why? Because ultimately all this was uh, arrangement of Krishna so that the Srimad Bhagavatam can be spoken. But the boy, although direct representative of God, like the Brahmana, the spiritual person, actually he acted under the influence of the external or material energy of God. So he was under Maya. It's very interesting, opposite. So in our life also can be like that, like someone sometimes 
may look very spiritual person, someone else may look very mundane person, but actually one can be on a higher spiritual level than the other one. Because it's a question of consciousness. It's not a question of external position. Okay, I'm in this external position and I'm wearing this and these clothes. That's why I'm, I'm more organized. It's not like that. It's a question of consciousness. How spiritual is your consciousness? How attached you are to Krishna? This is the, the real criteria, not the external thing. How you can identify that someone is highly spiritual? Well, again, we are coming to the same topic. It's basically the idea that he will not identify himself with the body, but he will completely identify himself that he is servant of God, servant of Krishna. And if he is really identifying himself with the servant of God, he will act in this way. So if you practically see his life, his life will be very much engaged with spiritual activities. He will be practically serving God. He will be chanting Hare Krishna or whatever other prayers. He will be going regularly to the temple or the church or the mosque. He will be trying to serve spiritual personalities. Just by seeing his example, you understand. Oh, this person actually, you see, his whole day is engaged with spiritual activities. This will be the proof, practical. And someone else, he may be like showing that he is very spiritually elevated and he saw many, so many verses from the holy books, the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas. But then if you see, see he, if you see his lifestyle, he'll be just living like a completely ordinary person. And he will be after money and sense gratification and all these things. I thought so. Okay, thank you very much, dear devotees. Hare Krishna. So we will continue. I hope.